I uh, thank we you. Are, we are broadcasting. Okay, thank you all. Uh, welcome to session 3C um, on Give data a few, call. A few minutes for people to come in, just okay. so you can watch the attendees tick up if you click on the participants there. Okay, I will yeah. do that. I'll Great. wait for a minute because I can see them. Yeah, thanks. We'll wait just a minute because the other session started a little bit, uh, I ended a little bit late. Um, and just see, I'm watching people tick in. And unfortunately we had to, uh, we were squeezing a lot in there, so we had to squeeze the break. We were trying to keep 20 minute breaks, but the, uh, this one we had to squeeze to 15 minutes and then they ran over a little bit. Okay, I think it looks like we've stabilized in terms of participants. So, welcome to session 3C on data quality and governance. As I uh, mentioned yesterday in my uh, opening remarks with Nigel, uh, the whole one of the objectives was to broaden the discussion in this symposium from just academic discussions of analytics and methodologies to a much broader perspective on the practical applications, but that also meant issues of data management, governance, collaboration with universities, other issues of that sort. So uh, with that, we have uh, five presenters and I will ask Catherine to get the ball rolling with six flavors of AVL. Catherine, can you share your screen and, and unmute? So, um, thanks, Brandon. Um, when I saw the uh, call for presentations about data governance, data management, I thought it was a good chance um, to share a couple of tidbits about how things work with uh, AVL data at WMATA um, to maybe get uh, the industry thinking a little bit more, um, researchers and, and practitioners, um, about the differences among AVL systems, because it's something we don't talk about um, enough, in my, in my opinion. Um, I think we've, many of us have had this experience of going to conferences like this and seeing very cool analysis. Um, the one up on screen um, is uh, from Metro Transit in Minneapolis from uh, TRB this past winter. And I took that back and said, all right, now how would I do decompose running time um, the same way they did um, in, their, in their paper? And I realized that our AVL system doesn't record the same information around stops. And so we really can't replicate this um, in our system. Um, because the characteristics of our AVL are different. We record door open to door close, but the, our system doesn't record anything about the stop zone um, you know, natively in the data. So we'd have to do all sorts of ex extra processing. And that has certainly happened um, with other analysis and I'm sure it's happened in reverse uh, with, with um, what we've done. Um, so, you know, but we do have a lot of different, a lot of AVL um, available. We have sort of three core uh, sources that come off the bus. We have an event log, which um, nets out to every 20 seconds-ish, um, and that feeds into various post-processing systems and uh, databases. We have a heartbeat um, log that's every one second, um, but which is stored in flat text files right now. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. And then we have the real-time data, and that gets stored both in its native format and as GTFS real-time. Um, it was six flavors of AVL when I submitted the abstract. It's actually now up to eight. Um, so uh, we actually spend a reasonable amount of time thinking about what is the best source to use for particular analysis? What characteristics do we need in the data um, to answer the business question that we have, the analytical um, question? I'm not going to talk about the details, but you know, what is the means of access? How, how much data cleaning is required? What is the frequency of the data? What fields does it record? Um, you know, these are all really critical questions when we set out to do some analysis. Um, and we've what I've found over the past few years of actually doing this sort of analysis day to day is the best source um, really isn't always the one with the most data. We often are just looking for something, um, you know, segment level running times and vary, you know, variation in running times, bus bunching. And so having um, a cleaned and easy to use uh, stop level AVL is really very practical, I think, for a lot of agencies. Um, we tend to go to the one that uh, we get through Corbato, through the through um, ODX, um, the clean ABL is almost sort of a, a nice side product of, of having the, um, their um, inference algorithms. 
Um, but I'm sure I know other agencies you know, have, have different um, options for that. But sometimes we find that stop level data isn't, isn't granular enough. Um, we currently are working on a project um, with a consulting team and actually Wiley, who, who you'll hear from later is part of that team uh, with Foursquare um, to analyze Q-Jump performance. And so to analyze Q-Jump performance, you really stop to stop is really not sufficient. And so we're digging into this one second heartbeat data and we're finding in the research literature that very few other agencies and researchers have access to data that is that granular. And so we're really in the process of exploring what we can learn from that about how buses interact with traffic and interact with, with intersection infrastructure. Um, and, but it requires a lot more work, a lot more tools. Um, the consulting team is building a Python package for us. You know, it, it requires a whole new level of, um, of effort to um, really be able to work with it. Uh, but it's going to expand our capacity to do this really detailed analysis in ways that we're really excited about. So keep an ear out um, over the next six months or a year. I'm sure we'll be talking about the results of that project once we have them. Um, so really, this has just been um, a plug for the, the, this group, the field, to think more about the differences in AVL systems and how it can make analysis more or less replicable across agencies. Sometimes the more exciting research prospects are working with data that other agencies aren't going to have access to, and it's not going to have that broader industry impact that uh, you know, people might be hoping for. Um, but also a call for agencies and vendors, you know, when you're putting out an RFP, when you're designing a system, think about, um, think we need to think more about the characteristics um, of the AVL that, the, um, that these systems are producing. Um, and also, um, more robust data standards, I think, are going to be a big part of it. So come with, come uh, join us for plenary six this afternoon, and we'll uh, talk more about that. So with that, um, I'll stop sharing my screen. And uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, that's 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 great. And yes, good plug. I'll make another plug for uh, plenary uh, six at the end of the day. So uh, that's great. Let me just. Cancel that. And our next presenter is Joey. You want to unmute and we see your screen. Okay. Thanks. So. Uh, yeah, this is a little bit of a talking heads themed talk. I just want to put out a disclaimer there that um, when I initially did this, I was really fired up about how I found some internal inconsistencies in our data. These aren't all internal inconsistencies, but um, some of them are, and they're all uh, annoyances for sure. Uh, let's see. Okay, so everyone has to deal with uh, bus bridges, temporary routes, stuff like that. And, you know, those aren't scheduled services, but we have problems with scheduled service. So if a driver can't log on to their duty, um, the bus doesn't know what it's doing. And the driver just goes ahead and does it. The cool thing is we still get some information out of that. This is an example of a, a Route 10 headed southbound into downtown Minneapolis. Uh, the only information we get though is when the doors are open. So we get APC messages and stop crossing messages associated with those, but no associated route or block or trip or even direction or um, stop IDs for that matter. So these are all considered sort of courtesy stops which makes it really hard to know, uh, for example, the throughput on that street, because if you look up all the stops for a route, you're not gonna find these. So that's one issue, and it makes it really hard to um, work with or even find these data when you need them. And click, okay. So <clears throat> another problem we have is uh, occasionally a bus will be deadheading and think that it's on a route. So this is what happened here. You can see the bus is actually traveling down a freeway going uh, almost 100 kilometers an hour. And it hits a time point, it thinks. That T sign is where the, the time point is. Um, but it's really unlikely that a bus would be traveling 77 kilometers an hour when it passes a time point. Um, so why does it do this? I don't know. But if you're looking through your records and you see a time point crossing, the problem here is we don't even have speed associated with time point crossings. You have to go back to the AVL breadcrumbs to find out what the speed was surrounding that time point crossing. So you would know that this is not a reasonable time point crossing. Again, makes things very difficult. 
and it makes me a little afraid of sharing some of our data. All right, our buses onboard computers have the entire block schedule as a sequence of stops. So you start at stop one and you end at stop whatever, and it should go in order throughout the day. But sometimes we find that the bus visits the same stop in sequence in the block more than once or out of order. This should not be possible. How did I visit stop 686? Again, this is not a physical stop. This is the sequence in the block. So it somehow went backwards in the block to find this stop. Um, sometimes you can figure out what was supposed to happen here. Um, if one of the stops has an APC boarding or lighting record, I'd probably choose that stop. But when these, when you visit the same stop with maybe six stops in between, I have to wonder if any of these are valid. All right, what a day that was. We have a 28 or 29 hour day, right? So our service extends past midnight. If a trip starts or if a block starts after midnight, it should be on the service day that it started on. So the, the seconds into the day should be starting close to zero. If the block starts before midnight and extends past midnight, you'll get times out past 24 hours. What happens when a driver logs on and the first message comes in after midnight, but it says you're at 26 hours? How is that even possible? I don't know. So what you have to do is compare to the schedule and say, well, the schedule time here was supposed to be 1 a.m., not 25 hours, and fix that. All right. Uh, our vehicles go off route. Everyone's do, I'm sure. Um, sometimes they are truly off route and other times they simply get um, confused about where they are, I'll say. So these uh, red dots indicate places where the vehicle thinks it's off route and where the um, red dot is round, it's back on route. You can see that Again, they have this block sequence where the stops are supposed to happen in order once and only once and in sequence. And we're visiting the same trip twice. So this route went, this vehicle went off route and resynced to the previous trip it had already run. This means that the second time around, uh, you're going to get adherence values. So it's the bus is, thinks it's 30 minutes late to each stop on that trip. So you better hope you figure out that that's not really what it was supposed to be doing. Otherwise, you're really going to screw up your on-time performance reporting. Um, finally, this is one of my favorites. It's not really such a problem um, of, again, internally inconsistent data. It's just a quirk in how it's stored. How many seconds are there in a day? Eight, 86,400. What's the largest 16-bit digit? unsigned, 65,535. So you need more than 16 bits to store a whole day's worth of times. Well, that sucks. I don't want to jump to 32 bits just for what, what another bits worth of data. So what the system does is it shifts the bits. And that means that your maximum value now for the uh, for a departure time field, for example, is 131,070 seconds, which equates to 36 hours into your service day. And when I first saw this, I thought, well, you know, I don't think we have service that operates 36 hours into the service day. That would be a very long block. And we don't. Um, that's just the, you know, no data code. The really crazy thing, though, is 44,670 is also a no data code. Ding. And that is because it's the maximum value minus a day's worth of seconds. I don't know why that is. That just confuses me. And the only way to know that that's no data and not an actual valid time is you have to check if your door open, door close times are between your arrival and departure times. So um, that one's pretty frustrating to work with. And again, leads to some pretty awkward issues. So I would say that, you know, heaven is a place where data is clean. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joey. Uh, yeah, I said yesterday that I thought data quality assurance issues were getting resolved, but there's clearly uh, 
more issues to resolve. And those are some, I guess, not so fun ones, but interesting ones. Um, I think our next speaker, I don't have the screen in front of me, but I think it's, is it Giorgio? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh -huh. Why don't you screen, uh, share your screen? You're unmuted yes. already. So that's yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. This. Huh? Can you see? Uh, just coming on. There you go. And then make, make it full screen. Yeah. There you go. Th yes, thank you very much uh, for the organizing great uh, efforts for organizing this conference. Uh, my, I am uh, Giorgio Ambrosino, Managing Director of uh, MEMIX, that my presentation deal with the shared info and advanced knowledge base tool for uh, assessing and uh, validating the public transport service uh, data coming from the AVL systems uh, the, in their different configuration, full or light. You know, for setting the, the sheen of uh, Certinfo, we could uh, uh, remember that the European Public Transport Framework uh, uh, present two main stakeholders that are involved. The, the PT Authority, that is responsible of funding, planning and contracting of the service, and the PT Operator, that is responsible mainly, clearly, of uh, the service operation and, in some case, of the passenger information. You know that in Europe, since many years, monitoring and controlling the service is made by the ADL system. Therefore, the, another main stakeholder involved in public transport framework is the IT, uh, uh, IT provider responsible of the system performance that uh, could affect the transport uh, service, you know. In this context, that uh, Certinfo works uh, on a large amount of the data collected by the IBM system and uh, attempt to clean the data and to report the performance service and to evaluate the performance of the service. You know that the main steps of uh, Certinfo are three. The first one uh, on the data collected by the IBM, identify the anomalies affecting the service. Second step, step one, there is the assessment of the quality of this data and producing the, we call certified data as outcome. The last step is related to the service validation in order to obtain consistent data set that where we could use different business intelligent activities and then for this to have the capability to uh, to check the performance comparing the schedule one and also the to check the service contract compliance you know when uh, usually when we call uh, we see the two problems, uh, um, there are two types of problems on the data quality. The, this problem coming from the technical operation side. If you see in this table, there, uh, each row reports some possible problem, the generative factor and the action that the Certifo could make on the IVL data. An example could be related to, to the communication network problem. Is a technical issues that affecting the service data collection? In this case, the uh, certain follow to interpolate the available data and estimating the transit time at the bus stop for each ride. You know that uh, usually in the company, these activities are carried out ma uh, manually. And then uh, there is uh, some um, by the team of the transport operator. The use of the info can lead a substantial reduction of the duration and complexity of this activity. You know, we, we, we info is in use on different uh, uh, operator in different area. You know that in this, this slide, uh, 
uh, we presented the results of the case study of Piumbino. It's a small area, uh, rural area, where the PT service is operated or a small transport operator using uh, we call a light AVL. In this case, a Cherso system. Using the Certinfo, the ride are automatically analyzed with respect to the identifier anomaly and adjusted following the specific rule defined in service contract. In this way, clearly, that not clearly, but the Certinfo uh, reduce the time required to the transport company staff to analyze the ride and justify the inconsistency the detected, uh, the detected uh, data. Okay. The second case is the Siena area that is operated by uh, a full IVL system operated by one of the uh, most biggest uh, European PT company. And as I say that the PT service is monitored through a full AVF system. Also in this case, Certinfo reduced the effort required for the PT staff in the analysis of the service. And the show also that the most relevant problem are related to the technical side, requiring therefore a specific intervention to the system and maintenance, you know, that, uh, you know, I make, I go, sorry, because the time is not uh, uh, much, but, uh, you know, with the Certinfo, we could uh, say that uh, main consideration about uh, the rule that uh, uh, Certinfo could have uh, not only on the public transport service evaluation, but also in system acceptance and maintenance. With respect to the public transport service, Certinfo, uh, allow the identification of critical factor affecting the day-by-day -day service operation. Also, we, by the experience uh, working with the TM, uh, in the use of Certinfo, we reduce the efforts or timing of the involved staff uh, in analysis of the service of about the 25 30%. And in, in the meantime, uh, enhance the capability of uh, public transport operator in service analysis and reporting mm -hmm. thanks to the rule of Certinfo. And you know that from the other side, in Europe, there is the contract service that is set up by the public transport agency. And then the Certifo could help the PTA in checking the contract commitment by the public transport operator. In the meantime, as I, I told you, that we have used the Certinfo also for uh, certify and testing the AVL implementation maintenance. Please, uh, first, testing and verify the system performance during the implementation phase of the system. Also, we use the Certinfo for monitoring the performance day by day operation for keeping the reliability of the system. You know, we use also Certinfo for assessing the quality of the data to, to provide to user information. And firstly, uh, and lastly, is to use also Certinfo for validating the ABL system implementation and the phase of the realization. That what I mean, I wanted to say that the Certinfo support also the system acceptance and maintenance, taking into account that high performance systems are the base for good performance of the service. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you very much, Giorgio. Could you uh, please uh, unshare your screen? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And next up is Wiley. There we go. Okay. Hi, folks. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I, right. is, is this, that's, I still have, uh, uh, oh, there we go. Okay, Wiley, you bring it, there's your screen. Okay, full screen. Great. All right. Okay, go ahead. Hey folks, my name is Wiley Timmerman. I'm a senior transportation planner and data scientist with Foursquare Integrated Transportation Planning. We're a woman-owned transportation planning firm in the US. 
And today I'm going to talk about a new approach for agencies to uh, QA, QC, their GTFS feeds, and talk a little bit about how they can support their scheduling QC processes, as well as just making sure that customers have good information about trips as they plan it. Um, I'm, we put together a app to implement this methodology I'll talk about with my co-authors Thomas Orgren and Sandy Brennan for the Maryland Transit Administration in Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, we think the approach is something that a lot of agencies could, could put to use in their own systems. So I think many of you know the story about GTFS. It's used for route planning on, on mobile applications, um, supports real-time information, and so on and so forth. And for Baltimore, they, they have a really complex system. They've got uh, a number of modes from subway to commuter rail, uh, bus services all around the state. And these services are updated with each pick. And what they found is that with each update, there would always be a few little bugs that sneak in, a, a stop that gets dropped or maybe some, some trips that were dropped. And of course, this is frustrating to people who are, who are trying to plan each. So the director of, uh, the chief of the planning systems at uh, MTA Maryland, um, who was the kind of the last line of defense on any problems with the GTFS feed, uh, was looking for a solution to figure out how these things came up. And she heard from the schedulers, oh, there's a trapeze ghost that's causing havoc. Uh, but she needed a tool to, to understand um, what was happening from one feed update to the next. So of course there is a, a GTFS validator tool provided by Google and many other feed validators. And it's really important when you publish a feed to use these to, to check that um, stops are near shapes or to um, make sure stops aren't uh, duplicated in some fashion. But they won't really tell you if a uh, stop that should be there is not there. And for that, you need to compare. So we worked with her to build a comparison tool that would tell her uh, if aggregate service levels had changed in a certain way, or in particular, what entries between feeds um, had, had changed. So uh, I won't go into the technical details too much in this presentation. You can see the long presentation for that. But the gist is that um, someone at MTA would open up a web application, they would provide two different GTFS feeds, and then in the background, um, this sort of comparison process would, would run. Um, and a number of outputs would be produced. The, first, the GTFS um, patterns would be shown, which would be useful for kind of debugging any issues with stop patterns. And this was um, a neat trick in that we integrated Tableau within this web application so that um, agency users who were familiar with that interface didn't have to relearn a new user interface. They had the power of Tableau, which is really great, but they also had a number of static and reports that would come out that would show more line by line what, what IDs had changed, as well as an aggregate service levels that had gone up or down, number of trips by pattern, number of stops by pattern, and so on and so forth. So, to get this helps to catch any issues that can arise moving from one feed to the next uh, between service changes. So, of course, there are challenges. Nothing's uh, going to work uh, all the time. Uh, for one thing, you might immediately think, oh, if, if you've got an issue in one feed and then you, uh, that issue is, continues to be there in the next feed, there will be no difference between the two feeds on that dimension. And therefore, you won't see a problem arise. Uh, and that does indeed happen. And similarly, at major service changes, there can just be a lot to look at, and um, there's no real shortcut there to say, you know, this is, we think this is a, a bad change or a good change, we can just show that it is a change. And then one of the big challenges with working with GTFS data, especially as it comes out of tools like Trapeze, is that IDs uh, that identify stops or trips can change, and so um, you need more tools to, to deal with those things. And I don't think we've worked out all of these issues, but um, one approach is to look at um, stop patterns and then to kind of rebuild unique identifiers from that. Um, or you can just kind of look at the aggregate data to see at a high level our service levels. But in reality, we know that the, the true trapeze ghost, as it turned out, like Scooby-Doo and we're pulling out the mask, um, is that it, up, upstream in the process as the schedules were being built, um, there are just practices and procedures with trapeze that could result in people um, moving a time point and then losing intermediate stops. And so it was a mix of uh, kind of moving our tools up the chain a little bit such that folks 
where building schedules could have more dashboards for them to look at their, their services they're building it. Um, and that was one of the strategies uh, that we're continuing to work on to help um, the agency deal with GTFS QA QC issues. So I'd love to talk more with you about this. If you have any questions about how we built the tool or how the methodology works, uh, please do reach out. Thank you. Great, Wiley, thank you very much. Um, yes, it's looking like we really continue to need uh, validation tools of all sorts. Um, our, let's see, our, is there, I'm sorry. Oh, Megan, where I don't see you listed up here, but are you, are you on? Yep, I'm here. Okay, good. Okay, well, great. Why don't you bring up your video, your, your presentation? Okay, it's coming up. Okay, looks good. So somewhat different topic, but uh, fits into the whole topic of data management and uh, how we deal with all these things. So Megan, why don't you take it away? Okay, hey, great. Thanks, Brendan. Um, so this is work by myself and Professor Mark Fox at the University of Toronto. Um, and I'll just kind of jump right into it. Uh, the data problem, highlighting the data problem that we've been looking at addressing. Um, and the core of the problem really is the fact that data is siloed. And I think we've seen kind of a lot of, a little bit of um, sort of examples pointing to this issue so far in the session. So that's great. Um, so in addition to uh, the cost of data acquisition, we see this considerable effort that's required uh, for data processing to really understand the data sources, how they can do, how they can be combined, and how they can be analyzed. Um, and this is really, uh, I guess, exacerbated by the fact that we have different tools um, in use by different researchers in different cities. So there's really no easy way to compare results or share collected data because everybody um, at the end of the day really has their own unique data models. Um, so what we said is a standard for this data is, is needed. Um, then the next question obviously would be, okay, but there's lots of existing standards. What about those? Um, the issue is that we've seen in um, transit research as well as in other areas, really these kind of activities require the integration of data from a range of data sources. So existing standards don't, uh, we found don't have the scope to cover really the sufficient the broad domain. Um, and there's also an issue with the encoding um, of traditional standards in that they're subject to ambiguity, despite uh, the, the level of detail that may be present in the definitions. So I just wanna talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. Um, so in the traditional approach to st a standard specification for data models, uh, we have detailed documentation and we have modeling languages uh, that typically will focus on the data structure as opposed to its semantics. So what that means then is that we have um, meaning, the meaning of the standards ends up being grounded in the natural language descriptions that kind of accompany these, these models. The challenge for that is that um, this natural language is inherently ambiguous. So this then leads to this need for kind of supplementary material to help to resolve individual issues as they arise. So things like um, giving examples and supplying best practices documents and things like that. Um, the issue with that is that we can't necessarily predict or um, detect all of the possible ambiguities for a given standard. So uh, what we have then is differences in an interpretation of the standard leading to differences in adoption of the standard um, and eventually impacting really the effectiveness of these standards. Um, so in our research, we propose the use of ontologies to address these challenges. And um, I won't get into too much what I mean by ontologies here, other than to say um, that these ontologies are essentially com computational artifacts and they provide, they take an approach to providing a formal representation of the domain, of a particular domain, so any domain, but in this case, we're looking at um, you know, transit and in the broader context, transportation. Uh, and with these representations, uh, we have kind of an explicit and unambiguous encoding um, in a way that we can actually automatically detect uh, 
correct and incorrect interpretations, as well as support other knowledge management tasks. Um, so looking at things like data validation and inference. Um, and so with ontologies, like is sort of a, a little a, a kind of a visual of, of the kinds of things that could be in an ontology, we're able to actually capture and relate terms um, from different data sources and also identify and formalize when uh, different meanings are associated for the same with the same term. So in this case, um, for this example, uh, maybe the notion of a root could be actually have two different interpretations to it and we're able to explicitly identify that. So ontologies really provide a way for us to address this challenge for data integration, as well as the limitations of traditional approaches to standard specification. Um, so based on this, this work has actually evolved into a series of standards um, that are being put forth uh, within the Smart Cities Working Group in ISO IEC. And um, the first part of the standard really just looking at representing the foundational concepts that kind of are required across the board, things like um, time and space and so on. The second part of the standard looking at representations for city level concepts. And then the third part uh, looking, which will be the first in a series of, of service level um, or service oriented standards. And, and the first of those looking at transportation, uh, including transit concepts. So, uh, a major focus of our effort um, or, or of our, of our uh, thinking in this effort is how can we avoid creating yet another silo with these standards efforts. And uh, what we said is that we need to be able to collaborate with other groups to understand how the definitions that we're creating are related to um, overlapping concepts from, you know, other, other related standards. Um, so to help us achieve this, we created a global collaboratory. And that's really what I kind of just want to focus on. This is kind of the plug of, of today's talk, which is uh, the City Data Model Global Collaboratory. And what that is, is a website that we've created to help us to develop a global consensus on the city data model to help us align and identify concepts and definitions that should be in the scope of model, as well as to align these concepts um, with concepts and other standards. So the website is intended to support, um, to allow people basically to browse and review content, to comment on existing content, as well as suggest changes, to propose terms and definitions that are missing, as well as um, submitting use cases to kind of explain or justify the need for some additional term or different definition, for example. Uh, and then finally, most importantly, uh, to be able to, to support the identification of mappings between related terms so we can really understand uh, how everything fits in together. So I just kind of want to finish by saying that we're in the early stages of this um, and we really welcome any kind of feedback as well as participation in this work. Um, the URL for the website is on this slide here and uh, my contact information is on the slides as well. Um, so please do feel free to reach out if you have any comments, questions, um, we'd be happy to hear them. So thank you. Thank you, Megan. That's uh, very interesting. We'll come back to that. So if you can turn off your show and can we get every, let me just first ask, um, let's see. Okay. Um, Willem, are you there or is anybody there? I'm here. What's up? <laughs> there's, there, I think there's like a polling question I thought we might do now before we get into the Q&A. Do you have it? I do. Just give me one second here. Sure. Thank you. I don't know if you want to introduce it. Uh, I think it'll be pretty self-explanatory and I think anybody in this room is... Uh, All right. It's so, up. So there you go. Uh, this, this is trying to test my hypothesis of where people are in terms of uh, uh, data quality issues. So if you can take 30 seconds and pick one of these. Of, uh, it, I know this is something that over the years I've monitored and people spent most of their effort for many years on. I think it's slowly decreasing, but I'm not totally sure given the presentations today. So I thought it might be fun to have a quick poll from the, uh, we're about 55 people in the room right now. So, um, yeah, go there. That's it, uh, Willem, we got most of the people. We are at 74% voted in rising. 
last okay. few people get their uh, get their votes in. Get their votes in. There we go. Maybe give another ten seconds here. Okay, sounds good. Right yep. Look good. Yeah, eighty percent is not too bad. Better than in normal elections, I think. So. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we put up the results and see what people said? Okay. <laughs> Well, I think uh, there's still, uh, I think that gives a pretty good indication that uh, quality assurance is still a major challenge. 50% um, are very difficult or extremely challenging and only 8% thinking it's relatively manageable. Uh, I think that sets the stage. So maybe uh, all of you can turn on your, uh, your videos and then and uh, yeah, just we'll have a we have we have a few minutes for for questions and discussions. And um, I uh, um, yeah, I would sort of I think I think all of the presentations will sort of underline the um, or at least the, the first four underline the the challenge of quality assurance. Um, I guess one thing I, I raised yesterday that's a source of frustration is that you would think some of these quality assurance challenges could be enhanced by better diagnostic tools provided by the suppliers of the systems. I mean, uh, some of the things that Joey brought up are pretty detailed, but uh, you know, even basic things of identifying corrupt data or what's the source of the corruption or missing data, uh, I, I find that I, I understand it's not, uh, it's, I don't know if that's gotten better. I guess that's a general question. Do you find you're getting better um, uh, diagnostic tools that, that help you solve these quality assurance problems? Joey, Catherine, now, Catherine, you're not on. Let me see your video. I, uh, I don't think we're getting better diagnostic tools. We're building some better tools ourselves, but yeah, certainly not provided with better tools for that. Um, we are, you know, the, when we find these things, we do bring them up with our vendors and we, um, we're working with them to, you know, to fix problems. So yeah. it's not impossible. But. Yeah, but that's, that's sort of, I think, Catherine, are you there? I, I don't see you. Yeah, I'm here. And oh, there you go. I think, um, for, for the vendors, um, part of the problem is, you know, the, the purpose of these AVL systems from the beginning was never performance analysis. They were designed for other things, real-time monitoring for, and, you know, diag diagnosing mechanical issues or, you know, there are the, and I think the priority that, you know, folks like the ones on this call put on certain kinds of data cleanliness and data integrity is just not where some of the vendors we're thinking when they designed the systems and many of us are working with systems that are now, you know, Old. not brand new. Yeah. Um, and so hopefully it is something now that this kind of analysis come using this data is becoming more and more common that when agencies go out to get new systems, it's something that they're thinking about when they're um, doing an RFP or if, if um, vendors are upgrading their, their products, hopefully it's something that they're going to be starting to think about more. But given how infrequently agencies change systems, it's a slow process. I understand. And uh, uh, Giorgio, I think that's the whole purpose of why you developed the, your, your system was because of the lack of uh, methods. And it was even more important in Europe because in Europe uh, you use these systems directly to, to penalize the contractors or to, or yeah. to give them bonuses. And if you can't trust the, the analysis without spending enormous amounts of, uh, you know, manual labor to, to, to check them. It's, it's an issue. Uh, you're not on though, Giorgio, I can't see yeah. you. Yeah, 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 there are no, two observations that, uh, first of all, that, uh, uh, I, as I said, that there is a cinch many, many years that the transport operator in Europe, they use uh, AVL system. Now, starting the last five years, they, 
they have the problem how to manage this amount of data, how to analyze and so on. That there is two main road. The first is that if the system is bought direct, directly by the PT operator, need a good level of uh, professional people inside of the public transport operator because the IT vendor um, tune the system to the level of uh, the PTO uh, knowledge. From the other side, and then I cl uh, close that uh, now there is also many ser bus service uh, procurement that inside they foreseen the, uh, the analysis, the tool analysis of the data collected by AVL. And then this increase the, um, the request of this kind of tool. Yeah. This is, that, uh, yeah. yeah, in fact, that, that echoes a question from John Levin that uh, whether anybody includes in their RFPs uh, and sort of what Catherine was hinting at. I mean, if you're going to put out, go up for RFP now for a new AVL system, uh, you, you should include something in, this, in, the, in the requirements that actually uh, you know, measures and ensures or ha has those diagnostics about quality insurance. Uh, but as Catherine mentioned, it's, you don't go off, out very often to buy a whole new AVL system. So it's, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge and people, I guess you all are, represent sort of leaders in the field. I, I guess I'm a little concerned because a lot of places, uh, you know, they just rely on the standard reports that they get from the AVL vendors. They don't, I think all of you have access to the detailed logs and so you can deal, develop these tools to do the analysis. Um, I, I don't know what your feeling are about, I look at other transit agencies and I have a, you know, feeling a lot of them just use those modules and then they use them for their dashboards or their NTD reporting and that's, that's about it, but that's, there's real limitations. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts about that. I'll add one comment to your earlier question about why, why does it seem like these vendors don't provide better diagnostic tools or more accurate data? I think from what we've seen, Fast Front and also with working with um, very detailed AVL data is just that there's, there's a, a huge human factor the data is produced, whether it's the operators logging on in a certain fashion or just how the schedulers interact with the tool. And so much of that can, can vary by agency. And so perhaps that's why um, these vendors don't yet have tools that are universal enough to, to diagnose the particular issues that might come up with an agency. But yeah, again, hopefully over time, as people talk about these issues and build out tools and ensure methodologies, those will become more widely available for whatever may come up. No, that's, 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 a, that's a good point. Uh, I guess I'm being a little harsh, but I'm frustrated, so. <laughs> um, and, um, one issue sorry. that we've seen is that some of the, so we have like events that the system records and then we have the breadcrumbs or the AVL you know, messages that we get every eight seconds. Some of, to diagnose some of those things, you have to join those two data sets, which are not, not really the same thing. <laughs> like they're not easily joined and it, uh, the volume of, of those breadcrumbs, those ABL messages is so great compared to the volume of the event messages that if you just want to know if your, if your vehicle departed a stop, like if it really did depart a stop, not that it was deadheading and, and thought it departed a stop, you would have to load a lot of this ABL data. And so I think there's this sort of mismatch between you almost need a secondary processing system to to do that data quality stuff, and, and that's just not part of what these systems were designed to do. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I I hear you. I mean, the original systems were there for operations and security, and uh, you just had to know roughly where the bus was so you could dispatch ambulances or police. Um, a few systems in Canada very early on when I did the first conference thought this through or you had a vendor that was a totally different field that uh, actually put, put in door openings. So they got dwell times at stops and they got speed, you know, linked at intersections. So they got dwell times at stops and they got dwells at intersections, which 
it's only recently starting to happen in you know in, in most AVL systems. Um, a question for for Megan, maybe a little bit different. Just you were inviting people to 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 participate in your process, but I'm not quite clear what kind of people you were trying to uh, invite. Uh, people that have a specific concern with like data dictionaries or uh, who, who do you think would be, uh, would, you know, who, who you'd like to have participate? Uh, yeah, so I think r so far in the initial stages, we've mostly just had participation with people that are involved in like the various standards groups. So we've been working a little bit with people from other areas of ISO, like the IDS groups, um, TC211, um, but also people involved in OGC, uh, who some of you may be familiar with. They do uh, standards for um, like location kind of, kind of uh, things more primarily, as well as the W3C. Um, who's responsible for a lot of the standardization. Uh, that's, so that's the World Wide Web Consortium. So they're responsible for, for a lot of um, that kind of stuff. And then moving forward, I think we're really hoping to have maybe people who are um, sort of just stakeholders, I think, in, in the domain, because uh, that's really where a lot of the use cases come from. And um, I think we want to make sure as we're moving the standard forward, I mean, we have obviously um, through the, the standardization process, there's, you know, participants from different member countries and things like that. But we want to make sure that we're still keeping like, you know, the end uses uh, in mind for this standard as it's being developed. Um, so it's, it's pretty wide open, I think. Well, it's, it's good. It's challenging. I yeah. <laughs> I was involved in TC two hundred four. I, I saw developments early on in my career. Um, the people that tend to have the energy or the funds to participate tend to be people with a vested, specific vested interests, like suppliers, and uh, so it was hard to get end users involved. But uh, it's I think it's important. I'll mention it tomorrow, uh, including remarks. I, we're just talking about transit data, but the whole world is going to go to multimodal data and to smart cities. And that's just, it can explode in terms of the, and we don't have any frameworks for dealing with this, uh, at least not in a practical sense. So it's good that there's some basic ones through the ontologies. Um, I'm just looking, there's some questions here. Uh, not, there are more comments that people are having challenges about getting stop level uh, data. Yeah, and they, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's a, another comment about frustration with vendors. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll leave, that, leave that aside. Um, I guess this issue, I guess uh, back to I guess, the original uh, point that Catherine made, about the different AVL systems. Uh, in conversations with people, I often would hear the, a, a challenge they had is that if they had uh, separate, you know, there were maybe you know, a variety of different GPS locators on a, a bus for feeding into different systems that had been procured at different times. Um, and if there were differences or even at the ridership level, you know, if the APC system didn't match what the fare collection system was uh, c coming out with, there would be internal conflicts between, you know, the planners and the finance departments and the operations folks to say, okay, what is the real number we're going to put on on a dashboard? Uh, is that still a challenge? Yep. You've is there my life pretty well? <laughs> is there any yeah. way to <laughs> sort of address I, it? I, I do think. For, for us, as we've worked with, as, as APC data has become more established within the agency, um, people understand the differences a little bit better, you know, um, that, um, you know, why they're different and how they vary, um, you know, and so over time, we've been able to have more and more informed conversations. Um, it's still confusing when you're trying to figure out what to tell the board or the public because there's a number on a different slide that said bus ridership was this and now you know we're currently not collecting fares and so we're reporting bus ridership is this but it's off a different system and, you know, so it, it, it's definitely still complicated but um, internally I think we've made some real progress in just more people understanding um, the issues around these 
the, okay. the high level issues around these different systems. Giorgio, you wanted to say something? Uh, sorry, I was the, um, involved for many years in the transport company of Naples that uh, at uh, at the end, uh, we uh, the driver manage uh, five different uh, in term uh, in vehicle terminal <laughs> uh, on the bus because uh, no the problem the problem you you know that because you could put the specification of the in vehicle terminal on the procurement of the bus you know yeah but uh, but uh, many times you cannot specify the provider. Then, uh, because uh, it is uh, is not possible for the rules of uh, the competition, and then you could uh, specify only the functionality, and uh, at the end, if you buy Mercedes or you buy Veco, they come with a different uh, in vehicle terminal. The only things you should provide them the interface, graphical interface, and so on. Yeah. Wait, wait. In North America, we don't have that problem most of the time because, well, it's a different problem because they're procured yeah. totally separately for the buses. So I don't know if it's a better problem or a worse yeah. problem, but it's it's different. But you still end up, it, it, I think there's more integration going on, uh, but then it gets an issue of where do you, who, who integrates the AVL system or the, or the fare box, the uh, smart card system and, and so forth, and how you tie in the destination signs and, and so forth and so on. I guess it result, you know, back to what you were saying, Catherine, what I was saying is that it needs in, each internal organization is going to have to have some process for deciding which one they're, you know, how, how they actually report out and how, how they ensure and what they, wh which data they, they, they really trust. Um, I, I, any other thoughts about, uh, about that, the, the different sources of data and uh, how you trust them or not? I think it's one thing to keep in mind is it's generally not a, a question of this source is good and this source is bad. It's that they're giving you different information um, and that you have to, to figure out which one to use for what um, and, and how they can support and reinforce each other, um, which is a challenge for sure. And yes, and on also who owns the data and what that this, we'll talk about this a little bit in this plenary this afternoon, but uh, it gets into who, where does the data reside and who has access to it and who ensures its quality. Uh, there's different departments that have different objectives and how they view the role of data. Uh, and that's assuming that the agency really cares about the data in the first place. And, you know, it's not just collecting them for NTD reporting. Uh, but uh, so, so we're gonna, I'm just looking, I think there's another question. Uh, no, no, it's, Oh, yes. Uh, oh, I, sorry. I, there was one comment I was going to make. Was, this is jogging my mind. Uh, we talk about ridership. I should point out that when the Canadians were talking about their ridership, they use revenue rides. The US and Europe use boardings. So they're never comparable. <laughs> so I just keep that by because all the all the Canadian numbers are going to sound very small in comparison because they're revenue rights. Uh, so I think I think we're just about on time. Um, I went on thank you all for, for participating. We've got some plenaries this afternoon about data management and data standards including another plug about uh, the, uh, the, the plenary six, which will, uh, where, where there's a project that Catherine is the uh, chair of the technical panel and that was actually initiated by uh, John Levin and I was trying to support it called Tides, if any of you have heard about that. And so that's, uh, that's now underway, which is great. Um, other mentioned, we have a keynote lunch at uh, 1250, um, Carrie Watkins. And there we're having a little technical difficulties. You'll have seen there's an email. I don't know if it's been fixed, but you don't, they don't have yeah. access to the interact. Has it been fixed? I can confirm, yeah, we fixed the, the issue with the website. So okay, you should be great. able to refresh it and it should reload for you. Okay, great. Okay, well, that's, that's great uh, to, to actually uh, to be able to use the interactive to, to get access into the rooms. 
Okay, well, thank you all and uh, enjoy your break and then join us uh, 1250. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. Ciao, thank you. Thank you. Ciao, Ben. Ciao. <laughs> bye. <laughs>